We now come to a absolute highlight of this annual research conference at the ECB. A long awaited sequel to the meeting of two giants of our profession. We might also call it the clash of the titans. Uh, Paul Krugman and Larry Summers truly need no introduction. We have last seen them at the beginning of this year debating each other on the outlook and the causes of inflation. And it was 90% about the US inflation, which is of course, given where they are based and given the situation in the US uh, as being ahead of uh, Europe at the time, absolutely understandable. This time in the sequel, we will want to dedicate some time, hopefully a lot of time, to Europe, which is at the center of the present storm. The last debate was in January. This was pre-Russian invasion. This was pre-energy crisis. This was even before the upshooting of inflation uh, in the euro area. So we are very curious what you two have to share with us, your points of view. Paul, can I ask you to go first? Please, the floor is yours. Hey. All right, thank you. Um, thanks for the invitation. Um, so I want to give a, just a quick um, analytic perspective, uh, talk a little bit about the US and then talk about, uh, <laughs> about Europe where I have surprisingly diffuse convictions about where we are right now. Um, so, okay, I think we have a kind of a shared perspective, uh, I believe, um, most of us in this field, and I think Larry and myself, um, that roughly speaking, we think of inflation as being determined by uh, some, uh, some measure of uh, capacity utilization, labor market tightness, output gap, um, plus expectations of inflation. Uh, and then, of course, with with um, uh, volatile prices, uh, so you want to make a distinction between some kind of underlying measure uh, and the headline inflation rate. Um, the uh, we we've all there there is in in all of this an implication that there's some uh, level of unemployment U star um, at which uh, actual inflation matches expected inflation. Um, Originally, uh, the natural rate, according to Milton Friedman, it got renamed the Nehru, I think, partly because people didn't like the implication that you know natural sounded like it was good, and we didn't want to say that unemployment was good. Uh, but I think actually in this case, natural is better because the, the, the Nehru um, is, it involves the implicit assumption that expected inflation reflects recent past inflation. And so that it, it's a question of inflation acceleration, which does not as I'll explain in a minute, does not look like a good description of where we are um, in the United States. Um, the, um, uh, so actually, let's talk about the US for a second. So I have um, uh, two slides on the US situation. They're not updated for this morning's uh, um, uh, inflation print, which was a little upsetting, but don't want to make too much of one month. Uh, so if I could have the first slide for a second, um, if we can get that, can we get it? If not, uh, well, I guess not. All right, let me talk. Let me, let me just tell you what what's on them. Um, by the numbers, uh, current inflation looks quite a lot like uh, like inflation in 1980 which is our, our nightmare scenario is that we're gonna have a replay, that we're gonna to have to go through a, uh, a Volcker type period of extremely high unemployment to bring inflation down. Uh, and headline numbers, uh, the, the inflation numbers per se are very, uh, uh, are not very different from what they were in 1980. Uh, you have to bear in mind that they, we've changed the way we calculate inflation, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics does provide numbers that essentially backcast current methods to old data. Um, so we have high inflation uh, that, that is, 
a little bit lower than in 1980, but also the Fed's target for inflation is lower. So it, it, it looks kind of nasty. Um, what's very different, um, as par best we can tell, is the state of expectations. Um, current inflation expectations in, in, in 1980, um, everyone really expected inflation circa 10% to persist indefinitely. You can see that in consumer surveys. You can see that in, uh, there we are. That's, those are the inflation rates. Uh, and actually, can we move on to the next slide then uh, to show you the difference? Um, the, uh, uh, well, maybe not. Um, all right, let, let me just tell you what the next slide will show if it ever uh, appears. There we are. Um, the, uh, th this is survey uh, data. There's a real question, you know, how seriously should we take this? But every piece of information I have points to the same story. In um, uh, the last time we had really major inflation, we came in with uh, all significant players, market participants, uh, uh, households, firms, uh, expecting that high inflation would persist for the indefinite future. This time around, we have much, much lower and expected inflation, again, by all indications, market uh, surveys. Um, and we have very few, uh, there's a question about how, how good are the surveys, um, but um, for, for what it's worth, they show that people are expecting medium term inflation on the order of not basically the Fed's target. Um, the, and we are not hearing, if we look at anecdotal evidence, we're not hearing a lot of cases of um, firms granting big wage settlements and the expectation that everybody else is going to be granting big wage settlements over the next several years. So we, we don't appear to have a lot of inflation momentum out there. The question then is, in that case, why is inflation so high? The answer is that although the unemployment rate looks comparable to what it was before the pandemic, uh, every other indicator suggests that the economy is running unsustainably hot. I don't like that. I'd like to see the full employment, but vacancy rates, we can quit question them, but quit rates are telling the same story. Wage increases are telling the same story. The economy is running unsustainably hot. Um, the good news is that's all because of a hot economy, not because of, of expected inflation, uh, so that the task of monetary policy in the United States is to cool the economy off before it starts to bleed into expectations. Um, now, the question is, how much cooling do we need? And uh, if, you know, um, I, I respect the efforts to estimate uh, U-star from the beverage curve. Uh, uh, I've been doing some very back of the envelope stuff with quits, which is not that different. Wage increases are also suggesting it's possible that and under current circumstances, we might need to the unemployment rate to rise to 5% to um, uh, cool the economy off. It's hard for me to believe that U-Star has really permanently jumped that much uh, this quickly, that we might be looking at lingering effects of, of pandemic disruptions, uh, but nobody knows. Um, and the policy indication for the Fed is pretty simple. Uh, hike rates until you see the, the whites of disinflation's eyes until you start to see um, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a convincing range of underlying inflation measures uh, falling and, um, and, and a pretty clear sign. Uh, it's just uh, much as, as I, I don't like prospect of higher unemployment, much as I don't like um, uh, the, the whole, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that I, and, and the, the, the definite risks of a recession, because I, this is not something that you can fine tune, um, I don't think that there's really any alternative to a policy of of of, uh, of gradual rate hikes um, in in the months ahead. Um, re I'm relatively optimistic that the U.S. will get through this without a severe um, recession. Maybe no recession at all, but um, uh, but it, it's it it's clearly there's going to be some pain along the way. The European situation, which is what you're mostly interested in. Um, let me just say that it is quite wild. Um, 
and I have one more slide if we can just get it. It's it's I, I just picked this one up. Um, I stole it from Daily Shot because it's uh, and I don't won't vouch for the uh, you know, for the reliability of the numbers, but surely the general picture is is right. Uh, Europe is facing a gigantic energy price shock uh, uh, as a result of uh, having become reliant on Russian gas. Um, this is huge. This is far bigger than the oil price shocks of the um, of the 1970s. Um, um, there is very little reason to believe that the European economy is especially overheated. So it doesn't actually, it's not showing, it's not looking like the US in that respect. Um, and um, so you might say, well, uh, we normally tend to think of that policy should react to evidence of overheating and not to fluctuations in volatile prices. Um, and I wish that I was confident that that was a safe strategy to follow. But when you have a shock this big, uh, in fact, European core inflation has, has gone up substantially, although that's almost certainly basically energy prices bleeding into uh, other prices as well, rather than a, than a sort of underlying inflation problem. Uh, but the uh, can we be... Uh, can we uh, feel secure in the belief that inflation expectations will remain anchored uh, in the face of a shock this large? Uh, and the answer, actually, we can kill the slide now. Um, the answer is, I don't really think, um, I, I wouldn't, if I were at the ECB, I would not feel comfortable uh, relying upon this shock being transitory, um, I would probably be tightening. Uh, I think there's high risk of a recession in Europe at this point, but it's uh, um, now, and for what it's worth, unfortunately, uh, I mean, US data on inflation expectations are flaky. A lot of it is really just gasoline prices. European data, as best I can make out, are even flakier. If we believe uh, the Bundesbank survey, inflation expectations of consumers in Germany have gone completely off the rails. Um, uh, I guess I don't really know what to make of that. Um, but the uh, the odd thing is that although by normal criteria, the US has a uh, overheating problem that requires rate rises, the European, the uh, East Euro area has a, uh, an energy shock problem that ordinarily would not call for rate rises. Um, the precautionary uh, principle basically says that the ECB has to do some hiking. The moment markets are pricing in equivalent amounts of hiking on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, which is uh, probably excessive in Europe, but uh, it's just a very difficult situation. And um, the so I you know I've been a big dove. Um, big, uh, uh, I was wrongly convinced that we were facing mainly a transitory shock. Uh, I still think that there was a substantial transitory element to U.S. inflation, and there's certainly a large transitory uh, element to European inflation right now. Uh, but for the time being, monetary tightening seems to be unavoidable uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. And you need to feel your way forward to try to be data dependent as much as possible. Um, if that sounds a little bit uh, less hard hitting than you'd like to hear, I'm sorry. It's uh, uh, we really have never seen a shock like this. And we're all, I think everybody is making it up as they go along. Let me conclude it there. Thank you very much, Paul. It's over to you, Larry, for your views on the situation. Um, also, I keep on losing um, sound from the moderator. Uh, I just said that uh, Larry's turn is now, and um, I'm sorry for that. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here with uh, the ECB, with you, and uh, with Paul. I find myself in agreement with Paul on the uh, 
difficulty of the situation, um, the broad paradigm for thinking about inflation that emphasizes the degree of tightness and uh, the role of uh, expectations and the general view that the appropriate posture forward in the United States and in Europe both involves tightening, albeit for somewhat different reasons, the presence of overheating in the United States and the presence of potentially increasingly unanchored expectations given the magnitude of the energy shock uh, in uh, Europe. I have a perhaps slightly more simplistic and certainly more hawkish view of all of this uh, than Paul has and have had that uh, for uh, quite some time. I reread um, over the last week uh, Arthur Burns' famous 1979 uh, lecture on the anguish of central banking and read relevant histories of uh, the 1970s. And what I was struck by was the pervasive presence of themes we hear today. You have to distinguish in a major way between supply and demand shocks. Recessions are enormously costly and for risk aversion reasons, you need to avoid taking chances on uh, the risk of uh, recessions. It is not clear how anchored or unanchored uh, expectations are. Movements need to be made uh, gradually. It, I think, bears emphasis just how catastrophic that paradigm was around the world and just how high unemployment had to get in the United States and elsewhere with how much pain to control the inflation. And so when I hear arguments about expectations are anchored, I think to myself, so far. And I think to myself that they are anchored is a tribute to 40 years of policy when the kind of approach that emphasized the role of transit, so-called transitory inflation and supply side factors was uh, substantially uh, discounted. And the mandate was seen crucially as assuring uh, price stability. With respect to the United States, I think what was quite plausible was to suppose last year when unemployment insurance had a replacement rate for most workers above 100%, that the natural rate of unemployment was substantially displaced upwards for transitory reasons relating to those benefits and to COVID. The fact that we're now a year past all the cash payments, a year past all the elevated unemployment insurance, and the beverage curve has not shifted inwards much at all, suggests to me that at least as a precautionary assumption, we should assume that we are in substantially overheated uh, territory. So my judgment would be that neutral in the United States involved an unemployment rate, given the current structure of uh, the labor market, in the general range of uh, 5%. I look at core inflation, which was faster this month than last month, faster this quarter than last quarter, faster in the last six months than in the previous six months, and faster in the last year than in the previous uh, year and ran at 7.2% uh, this month. 
I look at wage inflation that, according to what I regard as the best available data from the Atlanta Fed, is surely running above 5%. And I cannot understand the view that it is likely to return to a 2% target without unemployment being meaningfully above the uh, natural rate of unemployment. So I think that if we pursue policies in the United States that successfully restore inflation to target, it is very likely that uh, we will have a recession that will bring the unemployment rate uh, to 6% or more. That is, of course, a situation vastly different than the 10.8% that Paul Volcker had to bring about or that we saw during the financial crisis or that we saw in the aftermath of uh, COVID. But the stark fact in the industrial world is that there are almost no examples in which inflation was above four, unemployment was below four, and a recession did not start within the last two, within the subsequent two years. And that there are no examples in the United States in which the unemployment rate was driven up by half a percent without being driven up by more than 2%. And so it seems to me that the likelihood is that if we are to bring inflation down in the vicinity of target, we will have a meaningful recession. It seems to me that for us to make a decision not to do that because it was too painful would be to invite uh, the end of the bit of good news that Paul is pointing to, the fact that expectations are now substantially lower for three years than for one year, and are running substantially below the level of uh, headline inflation. I think that Paul's comments uh, with respect to uh, Europe uh, that highlighted the much greater difficulty of the problem because it was made exogenously or made externally rather than made internally by uh, bad uh, policy. And because of the recessionary consequences of the large terms of trade loss, I think all of that is uh, correct. But I also do not see an alternative to a significant increase uh, in rates if expectations are to become uh, anchored, uh, are to remain at all uh, anchored. And I think there is the additional uh, factor, in an, certainly in the United Kingdom, potentially in other parts of uh, Europe, of significant fiscal irresponsibility leading to uh, reductions in uh, credibility. I am less convinced of the case for gradualism in central bank adjustments uh, than I think uh, many are. I don't think there's any substantial probability in the United States that this episode can be managed without rates being risen, being raised to close to 4%. And in that context, it seems to me better to move rapidly than to move uh, slowly. It has seemed self-evident to me for some time now that a 75 basis point move in September is appropriate. And if I had to choose between a 100 basis point move in September and a 50 basis point move in September, I would choose a 100 basis point uh, move so as to reinforce uh, credibility. Seems to me that the move 
that many regarded as surprisingly large by the ECB recently was also uh, entirely uh, was also entirely appropriate. And I think moving more strongly sooner has benefits in terms of credibility and therefore reducing the ultimate amount of restriction that is necessary that exceed any costs of the possibility that the move will need to be uh, reversed uh, quite uh, quickly. In general, I think it is possible, but the judgments currently expressed in markets about likely tightening represent something that I would regard as a quite optimistic scenario in both the United States and in Europe, not as a best guess. Finally, while I'm very much aware of uh, the differences between the United States and Europe and the differences within Europe and the differences between the United States and Europe and Japan and other places, I am struck by the lack of common international commitment and international signaling in the current moment. It seems to me that for there to be a general recognition of the salience of inflation as a central problem, of the challenges that will face the developing world as a consequence of the necessary adjustments in the uh, industrial uh, world, of the possible uh, risks not yet realized from excessive exchange rate instability, and the sense that there is a collective macroeconomic management on the case globally would reinforce everybody's credibility in a very valuable way. And I have been disappointed by the absence of the kind of strong global signaling that has been present at a variety of other very difficult uh, financial moments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Larry. That was uh, very clear. And you have also already anticipated some of the next questions I was going to go into, namely the question of where do we go from here and at what velocity uh, in terms of interest rates. But let me nevertheless uh, dwell on this forward looking short run, short to medium run a bit more. So uh, we all know winter is coming. And uh, we don't know how hard or cold it's going to be, but I certainly can say that in Europe and especially also in Germany, people are buying firewood. And it is hard to buy firewood. That price has also gone up, not only the one of gas. Um, recession is a, something that is clearly uh, very much on people's minds and fears, as is the question of how much energy will be available. So your views on the European economy, uh, Paul, you recently called it an agonizing choice that uh, the Europeans and the European Central Bank is facing here. So the question about how does the economy evolve and what are, is the appropriate path for interest rate increases uh, and the outlook for them. What is your advice? Uh, and maybe you can also say something about fiscal policy, uh, which clearly also has an impact and uh, is right now also mostly busy with, the, uh, with dealing with the energy crisis and shielding households at great expense. So Paul, back to you with a bit more detail, please, on path of the interest rate okay. in Europe. I'm actually having a very hard time just to, to say in terms of trying to put a number on how much uh, ECB rates need to rise. It's just a very, um, part of the problem is that, that we have uh, uh, quite weak uh, 
uh, estimates, they're not great for the U.S., but estimates of the the, the uh, transmission mechanism from, from interest rates to real activity in Europe are even, even less uh, secure. Um, but I, I regretfully agree with, with Larry that the 75 basis point rise by the ECB was necessary and that there will have to be more. Um, and uh, um, let me, in terms of the policy, I actually, I think we, we narrow it too much in the European case by talking about fiscal versus monetary policy, because there, there really is now uh, the question of um, policy to limit energy prices to households and businesses is very much on the table. Uh, and in fact, it's, it is inevitable. There are going to be uh, price controls and subsidies to limit the, um, uh, the, the cost of energy uh, to, to, the, to the European public uh, uh, over the course of this winter. Um, this is um, ordinarily economists are very negative on price controls and uh, uh, Larry mentioned uh, Arthur Burns and actually the, uh, the, we, when one talks about Arthur Burns, we think about the, the Nixon price controls um, and the um, uh, expansionary monetary policy, uh, um, probably politically motivated, uh, that that helped to set off the '70s inflation. Um, but uh, sit, this situation is, I think, a case where things are quite different. Um, it is going to be necessary to limit price rises for households, uh, just on sheer um uh, equity social cohesion grounds uh, uh if if um, current energy prices uh are fully passed on to households uh, a lot of people will be ruined financially in europe um and so there's going to have to be a now you could in principle devise a a program of financial aid that offsets the price rises uh sufficiently um but in, in practice, the, trying to devise such a policy is probably beyond what you can do. So there are, in fact, going to be price controls uh, with s substantial subsidies to, to the energy sector to make them workable. Um, and um, probably in order also, there's going to have to be some, uh, some kind of rationing. Uh, and instructions to to limit maybe even exact. I, I don't know enough yet to uh, to figure out what it's going to look like. And you might say, well, this isn't this a recipe for disaster? Didn't don't we didn't we see that happen uh, again? Uh, Arthur Burns and the the the, uh, uh, the seventies inflation. Um, and the the answer will be uh, the the reason to think that this is a um, a it, that this time is different, the infamously sarcastic uh, 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 Reinhard Rogoff title, uh, is that uh, there, in, in the infamous uh, Arthur Burns incident, uh, price controls were used to suppress inflation while uh, the, the central bank was juicing up the economy. In this case, it's going to be price controls used to try to hold down inflation while the central bank is tightening sharply. Uh, which could be a, a quite different outcome. And there is a macroeconomic aspect as well. We don't really know what the mechanism for inflation expectations um, in Europe is going to be. Um, but to the extent that we are fearful that energy prices will lead to a wage price spiral, then limiting energy prices, even at the cost of substantial fiscal outlays and some rationing, uh, may have substantial macroeconomic benefits. So I think when if we're trying to think about the European response, it's just focusing on the ECB and just focusing on fiscal impulse is missing the point. A lot, everything is going to depend a lot on how European nations try to cushion the blow from energy prices. Um, as I just want to back up on one point on, on, on the extent to which Larry and I are disagreeing. You know, everything that Larry is pointing to, which is that core inflation has stayed high and possibly accelerated, um, is consistent with an economy that is still highly overheated. 
There's nothing in there that says that expectations are driving this. Um, we, to the, to the extent that we have a model, it is one that says that, that inflation expectations are the reason why you need to have a period of ex high excess unemployment. It might be that that model is wrong, um, but my, <laughs> what I think I learned, it, 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 what I got wrong in the inflation debate uh, back at the beginning was that I kind of decided that I knew better than the model and um, and I was wrong. And I'm very, I'd like to know what the story is through which we need a period of sustained high unemployment if expectations have not risen. Um, it's possible it's there, but I think do think we, we when, when in doubt, stick to this kind of canonical model, which does say that, that uh, we need a rise in unemployment, clearly, but probably not a sustained period of excess unemployment. But anyway, coming back, you are you are mostly interested in the European situation, and I think the question for Europe has to be, how can you make this winter of discontent with the extremely high energy prices tolerable? And that is requires that there be a, a, a disinflationary monetary policy, but it also requires substantial direct action on keeping energy affordable for the general public. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, Larry, if there is something you want to respond, otherwise, if you can go to my last question, and then I will open up to the public in the room. We also have a few board members of the ECB in the room, as well as uh, audience, I'm sure, worldwide. Um, so my last question would be about the long run. Uh, perspectives on inflation and again your perspectives for the US and uh, Europe if you think they differ. You might also want to comment on the strategies, the monetary strategies, which in your last debate you were uh, back in January uh, discussing in the view of, the, of today's situation or of then situation which today looks even more grave. So um, uh, to you Larry. <laughs> Let me let me make a uh, a few uh, observations, uh, Paul. I think the inflation mechanism involves heavily overlapping wage contracts and the like, and I put substantial weight on the fact that job switchers are seeing much larger wage increases than job stayers, and that gap is larger than it has ever been. And that suggests to me that there is a lot of wage momentum that is uh, currently built in. And I guess I think of Bob Gordon Phillips curves as being canonical models and people who want to make assumptions different from Bob Gordon Phillips curves um, probably have the burden of thinking that they're using a different model. We're in agreement on the importance of fiscal as well as monetary policy uh, in Europe. I'd offer the general observation that it would be surprising to me if this was a good moment for there to be a significant decline in European real interest rates. And without significant increases in nominal interest rates, that's likely to be what happens as uh, inflation uh, accelerates. I recognize there's a subtlety about which inflation measure goes into the construction of uh, real interest rates. I agree with you, Paul, on the central importance of fiscal policies that uh, cushion what's happening in uh, energy prices. As I heard you, though, I thought less about Arthur Burns' price controls in the early 70s than Jimmy Carter's energy prices in the late 70s that were motivated almost exactly by the kind of motivations that you described. And I think it's fair to say were generally regarded as disastrous uh, in their effect. And I think the idea that if you repress inflation and through rationing, then there won't be inflation and then there won't be inflation expectations and that will end up good. I think is conceivable and I can construct the argument for it. 
but I think is unlikely. These are not entirely new problems. Uh, it is standard advice in developing countries to protect people rather than to protect prices. I do not doubt that it will be necessary for the reasons you describe and given the difficulties in targeting to engage in a certain amount of, and perhaps a significant amount of uh, energy subsidy. But I think all possible ingenuity should go into finding ways to increase uh, supplies as rapidly as possible, even at the cost to other values. I think that it is appropriate to engage in significant support policies for households rather than simply trying to maintain prices at uh, current uh, levels uh, through uh, subsidies. I think there is some elasticity of demand uh, for energy, and that is worth uh, keeping in mind. There is a substantial playbook about uh, subsidies versus compensating households from which uh, we can uh, learn. I would be the last to take a doctrinaire view of opposition to any kind of substantial subsidy, and I share your view about what is necessary. I also think uh, that there is a non-trivial chance that Britain has put itself on a catastrophic uh, course with the degree of commitment to subsidizing energy coupled with the utter absence of any signs of commitment to uh, fiscal responsibility. And I would hope we could agree that that was not a model uh, for uh, Europe. So I share your view, but I think it's appropriate for central banks who have a long history of commentary on the desirability of structural reform to try to orient energy policies in as sound a way as is possible, given the need to maintain a sense of national cohesion. Two other points very quickly. Uh, one is, I hope it is entirely clear that the goal of everything Paul and I are discussing and debating is to maximize living standards, employment, comfort, good lives for people across all of our economies. That inflation control is not an end of, in and of itself. It is a means to that end. And that those who advocate more vigorous approaches to inflation control do not do it because we think austerity is a good thing, but we think that by acting more promptly, we will minimize the total burden and sacrifice that will be felt uh, over uh, time. My best guess, Beatrice, would be uh, that while I do not think it is the right thing to plan for right now, average inflation rates will be somewhat higher over the next decade uh, than uh, they were over uh, the last decade. I think a central question for monetary policy will be where neutral rates go back to as things normalize after the pandemic. And I am agnostic as between the view that the forces of secular stagnation will reassert themselves and the view that the massive increases in government debt that we have seen and the substantial investments directed at uh, uh, the green economy will raise uh, neutral rates. I believe that we all should learn a lesson of humility from the events of the last uh, five years. And I am increasingly skeptical of the merits of forward guidance uh, as a policy. 
My fear is that markets do not much pay attention and believe the forward guidance, and so it does not heavily influence the posture of medium or long-term rates, but institutions pay attention to their past forward guidance and so feel constrained from doing what would otherwise be the right thing down the road, and therefore you get uh, the worst of all worlds. And I would, as a general doctrine, favor returning to the extent that it is possible to a more Delphi Oracle approach to monetary policy uh, communication and a less forecast every moment and describe every reaction function kind of uh, approach. Thank you very much, Larry. Um, Paul, very quickly, because I really do want to open up, um, your uh, expectation for longer run inflation rates in uh, US and Europe, do you want to give a number, your number? Uh, I actually do believe that we're going back to 2%. Um, that, um, and this is an interesting thing where, oddly, I may be more hawkish than than uh, than than some of the other people who have been much more hawkish than I have. Um, there is a view, um, Jason Furman has expressed it, that that maybe as we get inflation down, we should sort of uh, um, when we hit three percent, you know, two percent is a is a very arbitrary target. Maybe at at three percent, we should declare victory and pull out. Um, but. That only makes sense if you think that we are engaged in a Volcker-style disinflation, in which case the uh, there's a, a point at which you sort of need to, you know, it, how much more do you want, want to squeeze it? If you believe, as I do, that what we have now is essentially 2% expected inflation plus an overheated economy, then, and you need to remove the overheating, then you basically go back to where you were before. Now, maybe you know there's enough wiggle room in there that maybe a bit higher, but I see nothing in the current situation that would lead us to lead me to expect that long-run inflation will be significantly above target. Now, over the past decade, it on average was below target, but um, but I don't think that we're really uh, I don't see any reason to think that inflation is going to be persistently higher. I think we're I think the world in 2025 is going to look an awful lot like the world in 2019. That's good news. Um, can I now ask our audience if they would like to ask any questions? I see Isabel raising her hand. A microphone is coming your way. So Please. Can you hear me? Yes. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, to Paul and Larry for their interesting uh, contributions. So, um, monetary policy is facing a, a communication problem, uh, which stems from the fact that monetary policy affects um, um, economic activity and inflation only with a lag. And this becomes a real problem, um, I think, for us uh, going forward, because as Paul rightly said, uh, we are uh, entering a difficult winter. Um, but, uh, and uh, I think there is a need uh, for uh, a tightening of monetary policy. But, of course, uh, what we are doing now is not going to affect uh, inflation during that winter. I mean, partly because um, monetary policy only uh, works with the lag, but also because certain parts, certain components uh, of inflation cannot even uh, be, be affected. So we have very little impact on, on energy prices. So how how can we deal with uh, with this um, communication problem that we tighten? Some people may not like that. I mean, people on, let's say, uh, that have loans on variable rates, they will actually be quite uh, unhappy. Possibly we enter uh, a recession and uh, inflation nevertheless uh, stays high over the shorter term. I think the question goes to both of you. Who wants to go first? Can I sort of um, weigh in there? Um, um, it's actually even worse than, than that because monetary policy operates with both a lag and a lead. That is, central banks control very short-term interest rates, which have very little relevance to the real economy. Uh, and what matters for the real economy are longer-term rates, which reflect expected uh, monetary policy. That's why even before this, uh, the recent ECB hike, 
uh, long-term rates in Europe had risen by almost exactly the same amount as they had in the United States, uh, even though the Fed had moved sooner and and uh, and and more aggressively, uh, markets had already priced in comparable tightening on the part of of the ECB. Um, and it, look, it's a very difficult problem. You want um, uh, the uh, even leaving aside the lead issue, we are in a situation a little bit of the of of the thermostat that responds to the temperature of the room twenty minutes ago, uh, and um, that's a very it's a very difficult. Um, uh, problem to solve. Normally, what you want to do is have a you know pretty good model of of what the furnace is going to do to the to the heat in the room. I'm, unfortunately, too apt metaphor. I'm afraid for Europe right now. Um, the uh, but we have very little sense of the models. Um, I think this is in the end why I am for more gradualism than Larry is simply because we are so uncertain about. Uh, how things work and the chance of of overreacting badly is there now. Of course, if you it, the chance of underreacting is there as well. But uh, um, you know we're going to get it wrong. Uh, it's clear the the odds that we're either going to have um, high inflation persisting longer than than people wanted, or if I had to make a guess, uh, the odds that that both the ECB and the Fed will turn out to have overshot is pretty high but you do the best you can and it's uh, there is there is no good answer thank you fabio Panetta. oh larry you want to go at this one uh yeah i mean i think i use the analogy of uh taking a shower in an old hotel where the water temperature changes with a 20 second lag from the time you turn the faucet and it's very hard to avoid uh, scalding yourself or freezing uh, yourself. I can't resist saying with respect to the United States, this is why it seems to me that the errors made during 2021 were so egregious. That precisely because of the magnitude of the lags, allowing yourself to fall behind the curve was a mistake. And I would have to record the judgment that the least responsible central banking statement of the last decade was the 2020 uh, Fed framework that explicitly disavowed the possibility of tightening until both they had seen substantial inflation rather than expecting it and until they were convinced that they were at full employment, which seemed to me to be a doctrine that didn't make any sense at all in a world where there are the substantial lags uh, that uh, you describe. But I agree on the difficulty of the problem. On the question of gradualism, my reaction is that that's right, but if there's a place you know you're going to go, I don't see the great advantage of getting there grad get, of getting there with a little bit more uh, gradualism. If, for example, you know or you're 98 percent certain that you're going to raise rates by 100 basis points, doing it over six months seems to me to have no advantage of doing it relative to doing it over uh, two months. If uh, it is beneficial, you will start to get the benefits sooner, given the lags, if you do it over uh, two months. And if it turns out to be a mistake, you can start correcting it uh, that much uh, more quickly. So I agree. But I think the principal basis for gradualism is that you preserve the right to maintain optionality about not doing things, about not taking further steps. And I agree there, but where it's essentially inevitable that the step will be taken, I think that less gradualism than we've customarily thought in terms of would be desirable. OK, great. Thank you, Larry. Now, uh, the question, the next one or comment is Fabio Panetta. Uh, 
First of all, I want to thank both panelists for uh, their comments, which are uh, absolutely interesting and stimulating. I would like to go back to this issue of gradualism versus uh, a more aggressive policy, trying to refer it more specifically to the situation of the Euro area. Uh, as you both uh, uh, mentioned, uh, uh, wages in the Euro area, at least uh, for the time being, are growing at a moderate pace. Uh, while inflation expectations uh, remain in line with our target. They are, by and large, uh, uh, in a, uh, a narrow range, uh, uh, around 2%. Of course, either condition could change very rapidly, as it was uh, mentioned uh, in, the, in, the, in the discussion. And uh, especially if inflation, uh, above target inflation persists for a long time. In this case, if uh, wage growth uh, uh, becomes much uh, uh, more rapid, or if uh, expectations de anchor the monetary policy strategy would be very clear. But uh, let's assume that this does not happen, uh, wage growth remains moderate and expectations do not de anchor. Uh, in this case, taking into account uh, uh, and the fact that in the euro area the output gap has not been closed, our projections would suggest that we will close the output gap many quarters from now. And Taking into account that the main determinant, the, the dominant determinant of the inflation spike we are seeing uh, is a sequence of supply shocks, would you still advocate for an aggressive uh, uh, adjustment of monetary conditions? Or taking into account the specific conditions of the euro area, would you not suggest that a more gradual adjustment, being ready to fine tune in case something happens in terms of second round effects, might be preferable? Thank you very much. I think this question is mostly to Larry, who was advocating the faster, right? I think if you, I think if you assume that even given the current structure of the economy, you are well short of potential, you assume there are no important credibility issues, you assume that things are completely uh, anchored in terms of expectations, then surely all your premises, then surely your conclusion follows. But I think it is a matter of judgment uh, whether that is the case. I, I think that, and I don't mean to be saying that, you know, policy should be a random walk where you should, if you think you're 150 basis points off, you should move 150 basis points. This is obviously a matter of balance. But as I look at the history of uh, monetary, uh, the history of monetary policy, I can think of a fairly wide variety of occasions on which policy moved too gradually. Ex post, it's pretty clear that that happened uh, during uh, the 1970s. It happened to, it happened excessively gradually with respect to the gathering financial storm in uh, Europe after the financial crisis. It happened in the United States during the Vietnam War. I could proliferate a wide variety of examples when, with the benefit of hindsight, it seems to us that policy has been too gradual. And I find it more difficult to enunciate examples in which, in retrospect, policy moved uh, too sharply and had excessive uh, consequences. And that's why, and it's a natural tendency of human beings facing difficult decisions uh, to uh, muddle a bit and choose incremental uh, measures that try to split the difference. That's what brought us the Afghanistan and Vietnam wars. And so when I speak up in general with a bit of skepticism about gradualism, particularly at a moment when credibility is in question, uh, that's right. But I guess I'd be interested in Paul's view. I think 
uh, I think I have a variety of examples in which, with the benefit of hindsight, policy was clearly too gradual. And I guess I would be looking for the famous examples of financial policy that was too precipitous. And if they're in equipoise, then I guess we're getting it about right. But if they're not in equipoise, that would seem to me to constitute an argument for thinking about less gradualism. Uh, Larry and Paul, I really wish you were here because obviously this is something that we should be keeping discussing for a long time. And there is a lot of uh, you know, interest in the room. I see people um, that would love to continue the discussion, but unfortunately we're running out of time. We have run out of time. Paul, can I give you one minute to reply to everything, please? <laughs> Okay, just the, uh, there are two famous examples of a central bank uh, overreacting to an energy price shock uh, and possibly doing substantial damage. Uh, and they both involve the ECB, both uh, in, in the, uh, 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 you know, on the eve of the global financial crisis and then on the eve of the euro crisis. Now, they were relatively small moves, but they, they do, if you want examples of a central bank that is reacting too fast. And let's just say that um, not to reverse Margaret Thatcher, not all surprises are negative. Um, just in the last few days, we're seeing uh, some re remarkable drops in, in European energy prices, which still remain extremely high. But it may be that the European situation is not going to be quite as dire as we think. So and I think that's about, you know, we, we could go on uh, for uh, another five or six hours on this probably, but that's where I would put it. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you from Frankfurt and thank you, Paul, for finishing it on a bit of an optimistic note. Uh, it is worth saying that sitting here in the Northern European plain where there is flat from Paris to Moscow, uh, you know, it does feel like we are close to a big crisis and to a battlefield. And probably in the US, you, it is a bit more remote. Um, but thank you very much for engaging with the European situation as well as with the US. Thanks for being with us uh, here uh, to this evening or in your morning. And uh, see you again online or in person, even preferably the second. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.